Welcome to the Celtic Myth Pod Show, bringing the tales and stories of the ancient Celts to your fireside. Episode 50, The Hosting of the Island of the Mighty. Hello, I'm Gary. And I'm Ruth. Welcome to the eighth episode in our saga of Branwen. Uh, but first, before we start the story, let's have some contact details. If you'd like a chat, or to contact us, or to leave us any feedback, we'd love to hear from you. So please email us at CelticMythShow at gmail.com. You can also leave us some voice feedback using the SpeakPipe widget on our website at CelticMythPodShow.com. We'd love to hear from you. We would. Do we have any news and views? Well, kind of. With the onset of lockdown, there's been a drop-off in people listening to podcasts generally. It's thought that this is because a lot of folks normally listen to podcasts on their way to work. So with lockdown gradually lifting across the world, lots more people will be listening to podcasts again. So do recommend your favourite podcast to friends and family. Let's help support the podcasting community. Yes, at a time like this, we all need to support each other. Lord, there are, there are questions being asked in the court and... Questions? What questions? They want to know why you were bought off when our very sovereignty suffered such an insult. So what would my counsel have me do? You should seek revenge for that insult. And how should I do that? You should put Branwen far from you for a start. What troubles you, my lord? I'm too hot to sleep. Then perhaps I could help you sleep, my husband. Branwen came up to him and laid her hand gently on his arm, her smile warm with desire. Well, our crops are failing now because of his reticence. His reluctance is making my people begin to call me an unworthy king. It has been a dry year, my lord. The crops will be failing back home as well. Only a weak king could... I am not weak. I am strong. And Matholoch lashed out and slapped Branwen so hard that she stumbled and her cheek reddened instantly. Branwen is a prisoner. Branwen is a prisoner. Branwen is a prisoner. Branwen. Branwen is a prisoner in the kitchens. Branwen is a prisoner in the kitchens. Bran the Blessed. Branwen is a prisoner in the kitchens and beaten every day. Fly, go swift and true, brave the seas to find my brother. Fly, go and find Bran, tell him my tale. Fly harder than you ever have flown before. Fly, Branwen! It is strange indeed to see how the great and wondrous miracles that occur all around us go unseen by the eyes of the sceptical. It seems that the less people want to see the magical in our lives, the less it appears to them. Many young children play with the miraculous and walk between the worlds every day of their young lives until the sensible and practical worlds of the adult world drive out the world of fairies, the rich world of vibrant colour that still dwells just beyond our everyday sight that still holds miracles and wonders just beyond the edges of our perception. The Druids teach us how to cast off the shackles of the mundane world for a brief time and glimpse the wonders lying just beyond our reach. But we cannot stay there for too long. The pull of the normal, the everyday, 
is just too strong. There was a time when a talking white bird from the other world would have been a marvellous thing. And then there was a time when that bird could not have existed and a letter was tied around its leg. Who now can say whether the wondrous, miraculous and magical things that amaze and enchant us are truly simple and mundane? Who now can believe that a great white raven flew from Ireland all across the Irish Sea and found its way to where a great man sat in a throne on a large, wide, grey rock listening to the cares and worries of his people? Who now can tread the paths in Caer Sienter Narvan, look at the great high walls around the fort of Bran the Blessed and not see the great white bird descending from the grey stormy skies high above? Who now cannot see the raven land on the arm of the throne that Bran was sat upon? Likely it is that the children of Llyr, with their noble fey blood, shone with such a great light that when the bird alighted on Bran's throne, he saw a wondrous and miraculous thing, and watched in awe instead of starting and frightening the bird from its perch. From its colour, he knew the bird was a traveller from the lands and places far away from the eyes of mortal sight, and would probably therefore have a story or message to tell. From memory of Bramwen's gift, the magical bird from Rhiannon had long faded from Bran's mind. He held up his hand for silence and said, Ah! Oh now, what is this, my little feathered friend? What news do you have for me? Bran the Blessed. Branwen is a prisoner in the kitchens and beaten every day by bloody butcher. This is the command of Mathlok King. Bran inhaled sharply, and the story of Branwen's punishment and the vengeance of the Irish rolled out in a song so sweet that it belied the horror of its meaning, and the High King was sore aggrieved to hear the tale. He stood to address the court before him, the bird settling on his shoulder for the time it took Bran to draw a deep breath into his barrel chest. When he started to speak, the bird took flight and watched events unfold from the ridge of the roof of the great hall behind the king. You have heard of the great sorrow, and worst has befallen my sister and the perfidy of the Irishman. Let my proud companions ride to all of the seven score and fourteen districts and command each district to raise an army and bring them to this place. Let us raise a full levy, a mighty host, and teach that cowardly Irish king the true meaning of nobility. Let us, more importantly, rescue my sister and bring her home to our green valleys and lofty peaks, to her family and to those that love her, so that her spirit can be healed. Those riders left Kersiont and rode like the wind through Wales to deliver the king's message. The shame of Bran's message burning and urgent and growing anger in their breasts. Their words were like fiery brands in the night, and each district heard the message of Branwen's punishment as if it were a personal attack on their own families. In the weeks that followed, a great and powerful host began to accumulate around the mighty fort. There were soon more men than the town could support, and a great supply train brought essentials through to keep the men fed. It was said that the mighty hosting had so many thirsty men that they nearly drank the river Seant dry. When the host was complete, they gathered at Duncannon on the island now known as Innis Dewi, and Bran stood tall and regal on the great rock of judgment to address the huge army of the island of the mighty. You all know my sister, the most fair Branwen. Many of you have been healed by the touch of her gentle hands. I am here to tell you how now one of these three most worthy mothers in all of Fair Pridrain has been most foully treated by her Irish husband. Do you remember the joy of her wedding four years ago? Do you recall the pride we felt and when we heard the birth of her son, Gwern? And that was only a mere four years ago. She has been beaten, she has been humiliated, and she has been cast aside by the man she loved, the man we all trusted. In treating her this way, Matholoc has insulted the island of the mighty. He has insulted you. We must seek retribution and bring my sister safely home. 
As the waters of Bridget's Bay rushed up onto the beach and the wind of the oncoming storm raced among the trees on the island, the nobles of Prodine decided to sit in council. Long they debated their response to the Irish insult and harsh were their words in the cold morning light. The final decision was as inevitable as the onrushing rain. There would be war. Bloody and terrible. The great hosts that Bran had summoned would travel to Ireland and force Mytholoch to face up to his actions and deliver Branwen to safety. Seven great nobles of Bran's court would be left behind to govern the island of the mighty while they were away. Evade the tall would stand for the north. Unic's strong shoulder would represent the interests of the west. Idic, the son of Anarach Gwalth Grun for the east. Fodor, son of Ervich for the south. And Ilch Bonelip to guide the centre Cantrev. Over them all, Caradaug, the son of Bran, would rule with Hlesar, the son of Hlesar Hleskugwid, to help arbitrate and Pendaran Doved as their wise druid to speak for the other world. These seven were the men they left in Edernon. The name of that place was afterwards Seth Marchaug for the seven knights who remained, the seven governing elders over all of these islands, and Caradaug, the son of Bran, as the chief elder among them. In days primordial, there were two mighty rivers that ran in the long, narrow channel between the Emerald Isle and the Island of the Mighty, the Hli and the Arken. When the long winter was over, their banks began to swell and eventually overflow with long ages of frost melt, filling the channel and making the two islands separate. The level of the sea flowing around the islands was not as high as it is today and after Bendigide Vran had assembled the mighty host in all of the boats and ships, they sailed towards Ireland until they came to the sinking lands off the coast of the Emerald Isle. The ships were abandoned, and they stepped onto the slimy rocks and waded through fields of rotted trees, their own weight toppling them into murky waters. They waded for as long as they could, becoming more and more unsure of their final direction amongst the swamp-like sunken trees, until there was a ripple of worry and uncertainty shivering the mighty host. And then Bran led them through lost ways of the other world, so that they would walk true and step up onto Erin's green fields, lapped by the waters of the channel and safe from flooding. He strode forward with his brothers watching him carefully. Never had he seemed more focused, and never more sure of his actions than when he led the great hosting of the Island of the Mighty towards the Emerald Isle. It is said that Bran the Blessed loved his minstrels so much and he treated them like kings so that when he was wading through the murky and slimy water he carried them all on his broad and mighty shoulders so they didn't get their feet wet. Be that as it may, the Blessed Bran followed his heart's blood as it pumped and sang in his ears with the song of Branwen and he guided his men safe and true through the murky waters of the other world. Meanwhile, on the dry green grasses of Erin's shore by the side of Loch Garman, two of Mytholoch's swineherds were looking after their pigs as they grazed and rooted for hidden treasures among the roots of the ancient and strong trees around them. They were lying down on the top of a ridge and gazing out over the sunken lands and had a vision. If it were only one of them that had the vision, the other might have declared his companion had eaten too much of that strong cheese and even stronger ale last night. But both of them saw the same thing at the same time, and they were sore affrighted by what they had seen. They sought an audience with King Mytholoch, and he agreed to see them. He walked into the great hall and waited for him to call them over. Removing their caps, they bowed before him and said, We bring you greetings, Lord. May you prosper. And may the gods give kindly to you. What is your news from the coast? Lord, we have some strange and wondrous tidings. We've seen some moving forest on the ocean, where never we've seen a living tree before, and there was a mountain beside the woods, and it was a mountain that moved, and it was coming this way, and there was a lofty ridge on top of the mountain, and a lake on each side of the ridge, and the wood, and the mountain, and all these things were coming this way. This is a strange vision indeed. And coming from the direction of Wales, you say? 
No Irish druid could read the import of this vision. The only person I can think of who may be able to read the signs is Branwen. Send for her at once. And so it was that the Irish nobles found themselves in the vast kitchens, and the Lady Branwen was pulled roughly away from the kneading trough and brought before the nobles. Lady Branwen, what do you suppose this vision means? Although I'm no lady, sirs, I do know what this vision is. Your swineherds have seen the men of the Island of the Mighty coming over to Erin. They've heard about my punishments and my dishonour. But what is the forest that was seen on the ocean? That is the forest of Aldermas and yard arms on the ships bringing the men to the Emerald Isle. We understand... But what is the mountain that was seen alongside the ships? That was my brother Bran, Bran the Blessed, striding through the waters to reach this island. There is no ship that can contain him in his eagerness to come to my rescue. Then what is the soaring ridge and the lake on either side of the ridge on that mountain? That is the face of my brother, who is in great wrath. The two legs, one on either side of the ridge, are his eyes as he stares towards Erin in his anger. Now run, little men, for my brother is coming. Bran's fleet were coming in sight of the long, wide, sandy beaches of Ireland, when Bran's keen eyes picked out the hordes of Irish warriors waiting for them to land. A thousand spears glistened in the morning sun, making the Irish hosts look like they were crowned with twinkling lights. Bran turned to his brothers. It looks as though we have a small reception waiting for us on the strand. (laughs) Aye, that we have, brother. But from the looks of it, I should say we far outnumber them. Taking the beach shouldn't be too hard. I believe we should stay out of range of their bows and wait until tomorrow before breaching, my king. What? And show ourselves to be craven? We should attack at once. We are not craven, sweet brother, but all of our warriors are exhausted by the crossing. They need time to put down their oars and pick up their spears. Nisian's right. We will wait until the morrow, and that's an end to it. The order was passed, and by the morning of the second day, the warriors were all ready and eager to teach the Irish that they could not insult their beloved Branwen. When the boat slid up onto the sand, thousands upon thousands of Bran's men leapt into the surf, making it churn and froth and leap into the air and they rushed to encounter the Irishmen who were racing down the strand to meet them. The battle was furious and bloody as twilight began to settle on the Emerald Isle. It was clear that Bran and his warriors had the best of the day. The Irishmen retreated back into the woods and the Welsh warriors let out a mighty roar and made to pursue them. Bran did not want his men to walk into a wooded ambush just as darkness was beginning so he ordered the horn blown to bring his soldiery back to him. Watch parties were set, and scouts sent out to find out where the Irish had put up their own camp. As the night settled over them all, and the scouts had returned with their reports of of the ships that had all been emptied and dragged up over the sand and stone anchored on the strand, the warriors made fires and put up their hasty battle tents. Bran and his brothers went down to meet, discussing plans for the attack in the coming days. Young Pryderi had not been allowed to fight that day and was bemoaning his fate as they all settled down to meet. For four and twenty years, the island of the mighty made its walls on Irish soil. Step by painful step, they forced Mytholoch and his men to retreat westward across the fertile fields, feeding themselves with a share taken from the farms and villages that they passed. After many battles, the greatest blow suffered by the Welsh army was when Bran himself was struck by a spear. He was rendered less than perfect to be king as the wound tore into his groin. There'd be no healing from this wound. The mighty Bran would remain incomplete, unfit to rule the land. But he refused to step down until his sister was rescued and the hurt that she had suffered had been avenged. He carried on fighting, and Mytholoch and his warriors were exhausted, and the Irish king was forced to take hasty counsel. We need an advantage to beat this giant of a man. Has anyone got any ideas? They far outnumber us, my lord. I know that. 
The best advice we can think of is to withdraw across the river Clinan and let the river be between you and him, then destroy the bridge that's on that river. Sure, and then they will just sail up the estuary and we'll be no better off. Not so, my lord. I see it now. There are lodestones at the bottom of the river. Neither boat nor vessel can go over them. So if they try to use their ships, the sucking stones will pull all of the rivets out of their ships and many will drown. We will be safe and have the time we need to regroup and recruit more warriors from the tribes in the west. Then make it so. We will assemble on the far side of the Red Lock. So this is exactly what Mytholoch and his men did. The army, exhausted and depleted, crossed the river Llynn, destroyed the bridge by the hill of the White Field and waited for Bran to arrive. The huge fleet of the Blessed Bendigade Vran sailed into the estuary of the rushing Llynon through a narrow passage and on into a larger natural part where the whole fleet came to land, near the mud banks on the southern bank of the river. Squelching through the soggy ground, they made camp close to a long narrow stretch of the grey waters, a day's march from where the broken wooden piles of the old bridge used to be. Bran gathered his court to hold council. Lord, we are stuck on this side of the Thlenum. Do you remember the stories of this sacred river? It is impossible to cross, and there is no bridge across it any more. Yes, I, I see that. What is your counsel concerning this bridge? I believe we must pray to the gods for their guidance on this matter. Matholok has earned himself a small rest from our vengeance. The vast host spread out across the land like the creeping hoarfrost in winter, and despite their many losses in the long war with the Irish, that brightly coloured frost stretched across miles of fertile wetlands. Camps were erected and many fires lit. Hunting parties were sent out for food and scouts were sent out to become way watchers along the shores of the mighty river. They waited and they waited until they received a sign. It was deep in the dark hours of the night when they all felt the earth move beneath their sleeping cots and they heard the low and ominous rumbling that seemed to come from all around them. They arose with the first light and saw that the waters of the river seemed to have risen, flooding the fields and the land on each bank. Bran sent out men to explore and he walked carefully through the marshy fields towards where the river had been. He quickly spotted that a rock slide had filled much of the river, causing it to flood. He walked back to his men and called them all together. Gather your warbrands, my brothers. It is time we crossed the waters and made an end to our troubles with Matholoc. We will all drown crossing this river. Do you want to make sacrifices of us all? We need a bridge. He is right, my lord. We do need a bridge. What is your counsel concerning this bridge? I have none, except that whoever will be a chief then let him be a bridge. I, myself, will be the bridge. And that was the first time those words were ever said, and it is still used as a proverb today. So the blessed Bran walked out over the water on top of the fallen rocks, probing every step for a safe passage, and it looked to all who watched him as if he were walking on the surface of the wide river. As his host splashed through the marshy levels, they came to the river banks, and they could see the river was as deep as it always had been, apart from the point where their high king had walked out on the water. They halted then, aware that they were witnessing the works of the gods. None wished to cross as Bran had done by walking on the surface of the water. All of the children of Hlir were calling out encouragement and pointing to Bran as he stood in the centre of the river. Eventually, Bran lay down on the rocks in the water so they could see the passage was safe and one by one, each member of the war band crossed over the river by walking over Bran. Once there, they set up fortifications and built a wooden bridge over the stones, and in this fashion, the whole host, aware of the Irish warriors watching them from the trees on the other side of the marshland, gathered on the northern banks of the Llynnon and started to prepare for the final battle with Matholoch in which they dearly hoped that they would be able to rescue Branwen. In our next 
next episode, Bran receives a very tempting offer from the Irish king, Matholoch. Hmm. wonder what that is. Hmm. Hmm. have to wait and see. Hmm. We've got an unusual promo for you this week. It's from Adam and Becca, who have a fun weekly live show on Facebook. And if you don't take the world too seriously, this is the show for you. Have a listen to their promo. Hello, Facebook. What you doing? You come to watch some sofa viewing. Won't you spend some time with me? We're having fun. We're feeling groovy. La da 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 da. Feeling groovy. Welcome to Fun Without Flags, Adam and Becca's live sofa show. I'm Adam. And I'm Becca. Join us every Monday at 8.30 on Facebook for the show where you get to ask us the questions. We'll share with you a thought for the day and an OM reading. And an oracle card that'll take us through the week. So find us on Facebook and send us your questions. Let's have some fun. Doesn't that sound fun? It does, doesn't it? <laughs> Adam is the actor that plays Bran in our story. He's very he's a very talented dude. We'll be hearing more from Adam in the future. Well, that's a bit mysterious. Mm. Keep listening and all will be revealed. Mm. We'd also like to send out a huge thank you to those folks who are supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Celtic Myth Podcast. Your support really makes a difference and helps us fund the necessary software to bring the show to you. If you'd like to help support our podcast and help us to continue to bring you future shows, please do pop along to patreon.com forward slash Celtic Myth Podcast and help us out. Well, that's all we have time for in this episode. And so it's time for some amazing music. What have you got for us? Have a listen to the beautiful music of George Nicholas and Canunos Rising, whether with their evocative track Maiden, Mother and Crone from their album Inspiration. And of course, all the links to everything we've talked about today, you'll find in our show notes. And you'll find the show notes at CelticMythPodShow.com forward slash hosting. And as usual, we'll be back with you next week. So we wish you a great week until then. And say many blessings and hulvaur. To Lord and Lady Toast we hold Candles silver, candles gold Libation to the ones on high Underneath diamond sky Cast your circle white And weave a web of healing light Mother, cast your circle red And weave the strands of family thread Old grown Cast your circle black Weave the wisdom that we lack Ancient mother, sacred three Death and life Blessed be Sacred wine, my drought and thirst never be mine. Release 
the quarters from each sphere. Depart in peace, depart from here. To Lord and Lady, hail farewell. To brethren here, we wish you well. Cast your circle white and weave a wave of healing light. Mother, cast your circle red and weave the strands of family thread. Old crone, cast your circle black. Weave the wisdom that we lack. Ancient mother, sacred three, death and life. Blessed be Is done for this night. Now we end this sacred rite. God is clear and shining bright. Jenny through the diamond night. All of three yet stands alone. Maiden, mother, and crone. Maiden, mother, and clone. Maiden, mother, and clone. You have been listening to the Celtic Myth Pod Show. If you enjoyed listening to this show, please come and support us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Celtic Myth Podcast. We hope you'll stay tuned for the next episode. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at CelticMythShow at gmail.com or come and chat to us on social media. All of the links are on our contact page on our website at CelticMythPodShow.com. We'd also like to send out a big shout of thanks to Coolands Hounds for our theme music, and that's available at sfhounds.com. This show is a Celtic Myth Show production.